Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we can sense your awesome presence here in our midst this morning. Father, break our hearts this evening, this morning, O oh Lord. Father, we tremble at your presence. Father, you want all of us. If Jesus is not the Lord of all, He is Lord of nothing at all. Father, but give us eyes of faith. Eyes of faith. That we can see, O Lord, that you have the best in store for us. That, Lord, when we serve you, O Lord, the retirement plan that you have for each one of us is amazing. Eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man what God has reserved for them who love him and who are called according to your purpose. But Lord, for that word to become life in us, we need eyes of faith. Faith that, that truly is substance in our lives. Father, we repent of our sin. I repent of my sin. And but Lord, by the time this message is over, that each one of us, O oh Lord, would go into a mood of retrospection and introspection. We'll truly see each one of ourselves in the light of your word, in the light of your holiness, in the light of what you demand from each one of us. Father, that an eight-year-old boy can put each one of us to, sh- us to shame. An eight-year-old old boy can have the courage and the conviction to say that there is no world in me. It's foolishness, O oh Lord. For a natural mind, it's foolishness. For the wisdom of this world, it is foolishness. That a man... A young boy can say, I don't want any money, I don't want any clothes, I don't want anything, but I just want God. But that is your wisdom. Because your word says, O Lord, out of the mouth of babes, you have ordered strength. Because of your enemies. And we don't wrestle, wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of darkness. And our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through pulling down of strongholds, to bringing every thought, every imagination to the captivity of the knowledge of Christ. But show us this morning, O Lord, what you have to say to each one of us, beginning with me. In Jesus' name, Amen. title of today's message is Wise Up and Live. It's incredible, right? I mean, through the week, I, I was not, I was not uh, told that I'll be preaching on Sunday, but pastor said on Thursday, you need to share the word on Sunday morning. And through the week, I was just going through the book of Proverbs. I don't know why. I was studying the book of Proverbs, and one thing that was coming to me is wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom. I just obeyed the Lord and I was just referring to wisdom and I was meditating upon wisdom through the week. And in the morning I just opened my computer and I was looking at one of the downloads and it says April 1st. All Fool's Day. Wow. 
And God said, wise up and live on All Fool's Day. There's a foolishness as seen by the world. There's a foolishness as seen by God. It's foolishness to young brothers, young children to say, what kind of a guy is this boy who says, all God, no money, no clothes, no sport, no UFR Champions League or no IPL, no ambitions, no IIT, no IIM, no MIT, no Stanford, but God. Just think about that. God's word says, if you are in me, you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, tomorrow somebody comes and says, you have the mind of the creator. The creator. What will we do? If you've seen the movie, Bruce Almighty, you know what I'm talking about. We don't recommend movies in this, in this church, but in the bad old days we've seen a lot of movies, right? I just want us to, sh- to, to just turn in one passage in the Old Testament. By the way, before I just go to the, the main message, I want to look at some 316s that we are not very familiar with. We know John 316? Everybody knows it, for sure. We know 1 John 3.16, everybody knows it for sure. And there are some 3.16s that it was taught and discovered during this week. This baffled me. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I'm trembling, you know, I'm just really trembling. I, I don't have, I just have a skeleton of the message and just... Trusting that the, that the Spirit of God would just take over and give us what He has to say to us. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest, manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Wow. Absolutely cogent, precise, one liner gospel. Fantastic. Another 316. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And what does it mean? So when, Tim- when Paul was writing to Timothy, he was referring to the Old Testament because that was the only scripture that was available to each one of them. And he said, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. By the way, the word inspiration means, inspiration of God means God breathed. Something that was breathed out of God. And it's proper, profitable for what? First is doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. Oh, these are all abstract terms. I mean, one man of God, you know, he said, a lot of abstract terminologies for people like us who don't have Bible college backgrounds, right? So what, what's, what do we mean by doctrine? In simple words, doctrine means what is right. For reproof, in simple words, what is not right. For correction, how to get it right. For instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. Perfect, right? It's a very simple way to remember. I, I love this. I like the way this man of God put it. I said, wow, this is nice. No abstract terms, but absolutely something which we can, you know, remember and understand. What is it? For doctrine, that which is right. For reproof, that which is not right. For correction, how to get it right. For righteousness, how to stay right, so that we all, all got, we got all of this, so how do we stay right? So why do I say all these? Today's passage is not going to be from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, it's going to be from the Old Covenant, 
as usual. Because all scripture is God breathed. So when we look at something in the old covenant, and if you have been coming to this church, we know that everything in the old covenant was a similitude. God put them as allegories and similes or what have you, and so that we, when we see that lifestyle, it's something like a parable which is speaking to our minds and to our hearts, so that we get right, I mean, we get things right and see how God sees things. So how, what is that God? What does this have to do with the title of the message? I want us to look at one passage in the Old Covenant before I go to the New Testament. I'm sorry, the, the, the passage in the, in the, which I'm look, looking at. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1. Remember, I talked about the mind of Christ. Right? We talked about the mind of Christ. So if you and I were to be Bruce Almighty, you know what we would do. Okay? So what's, what's happening over here? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. The later part is, lie, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. He never asked them not to touch. And the serpent said unto, previous verse, unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth not, that know, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you will be as God. In, in, that, in that you will have the mind of Christ, something like that. You will be like, you will be, you will know what is good. And what is evil? So substantiate this argument. Let's look at the last verse, last couple of verses. Uh, verse, verse 22 onwards of the same passage. And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of what? Us. To know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent them forth out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep of the tree of life. You know what he's talking about? He's saying, you, these guys have become now one like us. They have somehow got the mind of Christ. Now they want to go and take part of the tree of life. In other words, you want to take part of something without living the life of God. You want to have the mind of Christ without living the life of Christ. You with me so far? You want to have something which is of God, the power that God gives without the desiring the life that God demands. Therefore, he said, because he loves us so much, he said, no, no, no. You know what? If these guys eat of the tree of life, they'll become like Satan. They will be destroyed forever. So let me just save them and get them out of the garden. So that I can come in flesh and die for these people so that when they see me, they will first desire my life, which is a tree of life. And they will experience my mind, which is the mind of Christ. You're you with me so far? So today, the title of the message is, Wise Up and Live. And let me look at the passage. Where else do we find about wisdom other than in the book of Proverbs? Chapter 9 of the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> be, be a little patient with me. I'm going to build some background here. He's talking about wisdom. Wisdom hath Builded her house. By the way, in the Hebrew, wisdom is connotated as a feminine gender because of the language. It's like, it's like French. You know, French, everything is either, either masculine or feminine. You have a gender for everything. I mean, Hebrew is something very similar. So when he's talking about wisdom and, and he's calling it her or she, it's not that it's feminine, 
but it's actually a person in himself. And we'll talk, we'll see that that person is none other than Jesus Christ before I go there. She hath killed her beasts. Strange thing, right? You have All Fools Day. You have title called us, wise up and live, and you have communion. Three things have to be connected by God. What has something got to do with wisdom? All Fools Day and communion. You see that this passage is not talking about wisdom as an abstraction, but it is a person. Let me show that to prove that to you. She hath killed a beast, she hath mingled a wine, she hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens. Now because it's a she, it's talking about her servants as maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn him hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. You see that? Eat of my bread, drink of my wine which I have mingled. Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 6. Before I go to John's Gospel, chapter 6, I want us to look at Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. Chapter 8 of Proverbs, verse 12 onwards. Look at these verses carefully. He's talking about, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the frowned mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. He's not said, I will give you understanding. I am understanding. I have strength. By me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of judgment. That I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I fulfill their treasures. Verse 22, the whole thing changes. The Lord possessed me in the beginning, before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. What are you talking about? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's talking about Jesus Christ from everlasting. Now you have to compare scripture with scripture. Wisdom personified in the life of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 onwards, 26 onwards, 25, 25, 25 onwards. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is greater than, is stronger than men, for ye see your calling brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, of whom God is made unto us, what? Wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Did you get it? When he's talking about wisdom anymore, it is not an abstraction anymore. He's talking about Jesus Christ himself. So when you became a born again believer, people call you a fool. If you've come from a non-Christian background, they said, what Jesus are you talking about? They called you a fool. You're going to forsake everything for Jesus? You're a fool. 
But in my sight, God says, you are wise. So let me come back to the title of the message. It says, wise up and live. So what are the two categories of the people God calls foolish? If it is all fool's day, how does God view what we perceive as intelligence? What is a, who is the most intelligent man to be, to have lived on planet Earth, at least known intelligent man is Albert Einstein in the scientific community, Gary Kasparov, if you are a chess player, very intelligent, extremely knowledgeable. Gary Kasparov was never defeated in chess. But if he doesn't accept Jesus, he will be in hell. Albert Einstein never acknowledged that his wisdom was from God, and he never acknowledged that Jesus is Lord. Where is he? He's in hell. So what does God's perspective or vantage point of the people who are so-called achievers in God's, in the world? Fools. Simple as that. What? That's, what, that's a liberating thing, you know. If you are not an achiever in the world, according to world standards, in other words, you don't have a resume to prove your skills, to back up what you have done in your life and to say, this is what I've achieved. If you don't have a resume to back up your case, people call you a fool. But if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and say, I don't need no job, I don't need no money, but I need God. What is that in the sight of God? Wisdom. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. Through the Bible, there are two kinds of wisdom. One, which is worldly wisdom, and the other, which is wisdom from above. Very clearly given. Absolutely no abstraction. This is what earthly wisdom is. This is what godly wisdom is. According to God, Earthly wisdom, even though it is called wisdom, it's foolishness to God. So Lord, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 4. Verse 3. That is talking about wisdom. She had set forth her maidens... Sent forth her maidens, she crieth upon the highest places of the earth. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live. What is that? Wise up, and live, and go in the way of understanding. That is... Wisdom from God's vantage point, and every other thing is foolishness. And he calls it foolishness. Look at verse 13. Both wisdom and foolishness are called as women over here, but it's not that women are foolish. It's not that anywhere. It's just that a personification in the Hebrew. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of a house on a seat in the high places of the city. She's also sitting. So you have wisdom sitting here. You have foolishness sitting here according to God's vantage point. And then, to call passengers who are going on their ways. Whoso is simple, say and call. Whoso is simple, let him turn him hither and ask for him that wanteth understanding. She said to him, notice what she says. Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. What is this? Foolishness from God's vantage point. You know what? What? The world calls it wisdom. Oh, let me prove that to you. Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47. Verse 10 onwards. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, 
Thou hast said, nobody sees me. In other words, stolen waters are sweet and things done in secret are good, are pleasant. Nobody sees us. What does he say? Thy wisdom. That is wisdom. And thy knowledge, it has perverted you. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am. I am. And none else beside me. Next verse. Therefore shall evil come upon you. Thou shall not know from whence it riseth. And mischief shall come upon you. Thou shall not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. So even though people call it wisdom, and if they say, you know what? Things done in secret is okay. It's okay. See, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, it's okay. You know what? Sin is contagious. A man of God said sin is contagious. You might think that what you do in secret is only for your sin. You're just saying, okay, you know, I'm just sinning for myself. It's not going to affect anybody else. But you know what? Everything in your life will be affected because of that sin which you do in secret. And you know it, what I'm talking about, each one of us. Each one of us. That is the reason why God says, let not be your prayers be heard in the temple like the hypocrites. But the God who sees you in secret, he will, open, he will openly reward you. That is what it is. The secret life of every believer is something which God sees and he sees. You know what? Do you acknowledge me? Do you acknowledge that even when you're doing things in secret, do you have the mind in you that I am watching over you? If you're behaving as if God is not watching, it doesn't matter if you've got a big resume to back up your skills, you are a fool in my sight. You're a fool. You're a fool. People might call you wise, but your wisdom has perverted you. Just think about it. Just think about it. Let me show that to you in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. It's talking about the prince of Titus and the king of Titus. And we know who it's actually talking about. Verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Titus, Thus saith the Lord, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I am wise. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not a God. Though thou set thine heart as heart of God, behold, you are what? You are wiser than Daniel. Oh, I thought Daniel was the most wisest man who ever lived. But God says, you are wise than Daniel. You are wiser than Daniel. I have acknowledged that you are wise, but you know what? Your wisdom is perverted. It's crooked. And in my eyes, that is foolishness. You're wiser than Daniel. Oh, you, everybody knows, you know, if you read the Bible, two people who stand out as wise people in God's sight, Daniel, Joseph, Isaiah, but they were fools for the world. God says, you are wiser than Daniel. If I put Daniel's resume and your resume, in terms of achievements, man, you're wise. But that wisdom has perverted you. So it's very important for us to see and understand and know who is fool in God's sight. Who are the fools in God's sight? And there's a parallel chapter if you look at Proverbs chapter 9 and a parallel chapter in the New Covenant, Matthew chapter 22. (coughs) Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Next verse. And sent forth his servants to to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. You know what's talking about? Remember Proverbs chapter 9? Just go back to Proverbs chapter 9. Just back up a bit, and you'll see the parallel over here. 
Wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She also had killed her beasts. She has mingled her wine. She hath also furnished a table. And she is calling. And what happens? Next verse. She has sent forth her maidens to bid everybody to come. Go back to Matthew chapter 22. The context here. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Son is Jesus. That is wisdom. And sent forth whom? His maidens, his servants. To call them that are bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. It's two categories of people he's talking about over here. One, peop, one person, three categories rather. One person who says, I'll go to my farm. This Christian life is not for me. Second, he says, merchandise. I'm a merchant. I'm very busy making money. This, this life is not for me. The others, he comes, convicts them of their sin. They say, this is, you want to kill them. And this is talking actually about Israel, but I'm looking at the context of Proverbs chapter 9. So one thing you should understand, God is calling a guy who's going to his farm, he's the, that, guy, that guy rejected. Second guy, a guy who says, I'm busy with my merchandise. Third guy, who slew the prophets. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verse 15 to 21, we'll see the first fool from God's vantage point. And he spake a parable unto them. The ground of a certain rich man bought, bought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat. Drink and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. To put this into picture, look, look at First Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6 onwards. This is the testimony of a lot of our prophets. But godliness... With contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and, to, and into what? Many foolish and hurtful lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition. So if your heart is set on your treasure, God says you're a fool. That's exactly the reason why you have to go back to Luke chapter 16. Look that passage in Luke, Luke chapter 12, 16 onwards. Last 20 and 22, 21, 20 and 21. But God said to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. He's a fool in God's sight. Now, this is all abstraction, still not theory. This is all theory, right? So when we look at all these passages, and we know what a fool is from God's vantage point, we have to look through the Bible and see who is categorized as a fool through the Bible. And if you look at the book of Proverbs, the call is the call of wisdom is always for three losers in the sight of God. The scorner, the simple, and the fool. 
He's always, the wisdom, wisdom is always calling to the scorner, to the simple and to the fool. The, the, that, is, that, is the, that is the way wisdom is calling out. And if you look at the Bible, who is this guy in the Bible who stands out as a fool in the sight of God, but in the sight of man, he's rich and he's wise. First Samuel, chapter 1, chapter 25. 1 Samuel, chapter 25. People who come to the Bible study, you have a prelude already. <clears throat> Verse 2 onwards. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. Wow. Wow. Look at the way the Bible puts things here. And the man was what? Very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and a 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal. You know what Nabal means? Fool. The main name of the man was Nabal. If you look at actually uh, verse 25 of the same chapter, you'll see. 25 of the same chapter. I'm going to go back. Just look at this. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is his game. Fool. Okay. What is he? A son of Belial. Let's go back to chapter 3, in chapter verse 3. Now the name of the man was Fool. And the name of his wife was Abigail. Wow. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of what? Caleb. Whoa. Look at the... You know, man, that's exactly the reason why I put this thing into perspective, right? All scripture is what? Is given by the inspiration of God. It's God breathed. Is God breathed? It's quite possible that women can end up with foolish husbands. Maybe Abigail saw the rich and the resume of Nabal. Oh, he's got a lot of riches, a lot of wealth, a lot of security. What do you look at when you look for a guy or a girl? You know, these things, you know, it's not Abigail was wise right from the beginning. I believe the circumstances made her wise. If she was really wise from the beginning, she would have sought God and said, God, should I get married to this guy? He would have said, no. I've got somebody better for you. Some people learn from experiences. Wise people learn from others' experiences. Nabal is his name. Folly is his game. But look at Scripture, the Spirit of God breathing this particular verse. And the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a man of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. Peter, right? Pastor's favorite passage. Second, first Peter. When, when Spirit of God records it, you have to just compare scripture with scripture. He will not just put, you know, it's not like, I just keep telling people in the Bible study, you know. When he records certain things in an order, it's not like enumerate in your social studies exam. You have this, enumerate the fundamental rights of the citizen of India. And it doesn't matter whichever order you write, you'll get 10 marks, for sure. All that the examiner has to see, okay, he's got this point, give him marks. Otherwise, but in God's word, everything is ordered. God is not an order author of confusion, he is an author of order. Absolute order. Okay, so let's look at First Peter chapter 3 
verse 1 onwards. This is also talking about men. Because we are the bride of Christ. Okay? Just don't, just go and badger women after the, after the service is over. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation. That is, in old English, it's basically your behavior. Conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is a great price, for after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, and so on. He's talking about internal beauty. Is there a passage of where God talks about external beauty? Isaiah chapter 5. Verse 16 onwards. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 3 onward. Chapter 3, sorry. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16 onwards. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16 onwards. <clears throat> Verse 16 onwards. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16 onwards. I right, just want it there. 16. Yeah. Moreover, the Lord saith, Because who? The daughters of Zion are haughty. And walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Next. Okay, I love KJV, right? I love it. Therefore the Lord will smite a scab, the, a sc- uh, smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover the secret parts. In that, in that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls, and their round tires like the moon. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings. The rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel. Think about it. Changeable suits of apparel. And the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins and the glasses. Oh, okay, I'm going in the sun, I need to, to protect my glasses. Why? You know what, I put contacts, you know, I don't want... Talk about making a technology statement. And somewhere in BC. And the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be a stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a, instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. External wisdom and the sight of God is judged. It's talking just not about women. I'm talking about men today. You look at the advertisements on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on, on the television these days. You look at the latest advertisement, Axe deodorant. You see that? Is it not something out of the pits of hell? Just think about it. The googly. It was a famous thing during World Cup, and I'm, that's exactly the reason why we don't want to watch cricket anymore, because it's, they're selling garbage with, with so-called sport. What was clean, what was supposed to be a gentleman's game, has become merchandise. Let's go back to First Samuel chapter 25. <clears throat> yeah, verse 3 onwards. Yes, we are looking at 3, right? Verse 3. Nabal. Verse 3. But the man was churlish, stubborn, that is, and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. That's the problem. 
You know, that's exactly the problem so many Christians get away with. Where are you from? I belong to the house of Caleb. What is Caleb? House of Judah. Who's Judah? Son of David is from the house of Judah. So I belong to Jesus. You call yourself the house of Caleb. But what does God call him? A son of Belial. You know there's a man exactly the same in the old, in the, in the new covenant if you look at Acts. The book of Acts. Chapter 13. Verse 4. Okay, sorry, verse 5, verse 5 onwards. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew. The problem is, everything is mentioned, but his name was what? Bar Jesus. What is Bar Jesus? Son of Jesus. He calls himself what? Son of Jesus, which was a deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, and who's called, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So there was a guy who was a very prudent man, he said, please share to me the gospel. But Elymas the sorcerer, that is by interpretation, which stood, this is talking about Bar Jesus, which stood them, seeking to turn away the deputy, deputy from the faith. And then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him and said, O oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. You are not Bar Jesus. You are a son of Belial. This is a problem. And you know what? Such category of people who have a form of godliness, that's what Timothy says, in the last days perilous times will come, and they will be people who are lover, lovers of themselves, haters, imposters, full of pride, who have a form of godliness, but who have denied the power of God. And you know what God calls them? Fools. Let me show that to you. Matthew chapter 23. Sorry, uh, yeah, Matthew chapter 23. Second category of fools. Chapter 23, verse 16. Onwards. Woe unto you. This is the Pharisees. You blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind. For whether is greater the gold of the temple that sanctify the gold, or, or, or the temple that sanctify the gold, and whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swear there by the gift that is upon it, it, he is guilty. You fools. This is Jesus. You know what? The message Bible gives it in beautiful terms. I just wrote it down. You are hopeless. What arrogant foolishness. This is Jesus talking. The same verse in the message Bible. You say... If someone makes a promise with his fingers crossed, it's nothing. But he swears with his hand on the Bible. That's serious. What foolishness! Does the leather on your Bible carry more weight than the skin on your hands? And what about this trivia? If you shake hands on a promise, it's nothing. But if you raise your hand that God is your witness, that's serious. What ridiculous hair splitting. What difference does it make whether you shake your hands or with your hands, or shake or raise your hands? A promise is a promise. Whether in the house of God or outside the house of God. God is present and watching and you will be held accountable. Think about this. This is exactly the problem, you know. When they go, put your hands on the Bhagavad Gita and swear. No problem. They will put their hands on the Bhagavad Gita and say, yes, we'll, we'll speak the truth. You know what? God says, I'm watching all that. 
every idle word that you spoke, you will have to give an account. You will have to give an account of every idle word you spoke. He said, don't swear by heaven. Don't swear by earth. Let your yea be yea, let your nay be nay. What a calling. Otherwise you're a fool. Second category of fools. Let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 25. <clears throat> Verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear sheep, shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall he say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be upon thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shared us, now thy shepherds which were with us, we heard them not, neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while that they were in Carmel. You know what David is saying? You know what? Nabal, I protected you. You had so much of flock, so much of prosperity, so much of wealth. And I was there around you, and during the time I was with you, no enemy would come come and touch your sheep. There was a covering around you. There was a covering always around you. Nothing of you that, that had, that you had, the enemy could not touch. Because I was your protection. Who's talking? David. Think about it. People come on Sundays to the house of God. You know what they say? Oh Lord, prosper me. Prosper me. I'm gonna give you my offerings and my tithes. All I want is prosperity. I want no trouble in my life. That was a guy who's a born again believer who just comes to the Lord and God says, okay, fine. Your level is so much, I'll protect you. I'll guard you. I'll shield you. And a time will come when David will come to Nabal and say, Nabal, I need a part of your wealth to share in my kingdom. You know what? When you came to this church, you were protected. Your wealth was protected. There was no weapon that was formed against you could prosper. I was your protection. The church was your protection. You enjoy all these comforts in the church. But the time has come that the church needs your help. Think about it. Do we have people like Nabal in churches today who enjoy the comforts within the church, the protection that the covering of the church gives them? Oh, they need that ambience so that the children can grow in a godly manner. Or they can, they need a very strong word from the pulpit because you know what? They're from the house of Caleb. Oh, they need, they need correction, they need rebuke, they need a good word. All that is fine. And one day God comes and says, I need your help. You know what Nabal says? Who are you? Who are you? But I, you enjoy the protection of the church, right? So what? The church needs your help. Who's David? Who's Jesus? The moment it comes to carrying of your cross, Matthew, chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, not Matthew. Luke chapter 18. Verse 18 onwards. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandment. That's what we teach. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that you have and come and follow me. You know what? Do you know that the wealth that you enjoy, 
the protection that you have, the prosperity that you have, it came from me. But now I'm asking you, can you just sell all that and give it to the poor and come and follow me and you will have riches in heaven? What is he? A rich man. A rich man who enjoyed the protection of God's house. God's commandments. God said, if you honor your father and mother, it will go well with you and you will live long and you will have prosperity. You know what he did? He took that word and he applied to himself. So that he could get all the blessings from God. You know what he was? What, you, know, you know what he was? He was a mercenary. He was not a disciple. When, when God comes and says, please can you sell your possessions and come and follow me? I need that. I need you. I need you to come and walk in my, in my kingdom. Will you come? Who are you? They, he will not say. He will go back sad. But he's a Nabal. He's a fool in the sight of God. Because his riches are his God. And David comes and says, please can you part with your riches? Help me in my kingdom. Who is David? Who is David? Ask ourselves this question. Why are we here in this church? Why do we come and want to obey the commandments of God? Oh, if I obey the commandments of God, it will go well with me. It will go well with me. What if it doesn't go well with you? What if Jesus says, come, I want you to give up everything and come and follow me and you will have riches in heaven. Did you go and say, who is this David? Who is the son of David? But you call yourself Caleb. Oh, that's, that's, that is the indictment that God has with this church. Nabal, you are a fool. Let's go back. You're getting... The son, when God calls somebody fool and he names us as fool, it is really indeed a fool. And we need to check our hearts and say, God, is that there in my heart? Am I holding back? When I truly see a need in the church, and I know it's a need. I know people in my church are suffering with some finances or what have you. But I choose not to part my wealth with them. Deuteronomy chapter 15 <sighs> verse 7 onwards if there be any be among you a poor man of one of the brethren with any of the gates in that within any of the of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee thou shalt not harden your heart nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother, but thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and then I be evil against your brother, against thy poor brother, and thou givest not, givest him not, and he cried unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin. Unto thee. This is a commandment which God, which God is giving to the children of Israel. When they, he says, when you go into the promised land, you will have poor people always. There will be people in need in your congregation in the place where you are living. And if as God has blessed you with wealth, will you harden your heart against the poor brother? Or will you be sensitive to his need? Or when the poor brother comes, you know, he's going to ask me for help. Let me run. Let me run. Oh, God bless you, brother. God bless you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. I'll fast and pray. No problem. But if you obey the commandments of God, you know, look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. <clears throat> chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, verse 6. Verse 6. Keep therefore all these commandments, for this is what? Your wisdom. And your understanding. In the sight of all the nations. So when you see a poor brother... And when you sell your possessions which is dear to your heart so that your poor brother is need is met in the church, all the outside world will say, oh this is foolishness. But God says, that is your wisdom. That is your understanding. Because you have the family of God closer to your heart than the world. All the nations, all the people, that's exactly what Jesus said. When, not that you, the gospel will be preached. 
they'll see the love that you have one for another and they will glorify God in heaven. Think about it. Is that not wisdom? Is that not foolishness in the sight of the world? That you give up all that you have in your bank and sell it and give it to the people who are in need? And the ease of not the testimony of the first century church, when they came and when they saw the need, they sold all their possessions and they laid it at the apostles' feet and they distributed it to all them who had need. That was wisdom. That is wisdom. But the wisdom of the world will say, put it in this mutual fund. That bank is giving 17.55 returns, percent returns per annum. If you're a senior citizen, this much. If you're not a senior citizen, this much. And we're always calculating. If I give this money, I lose interest. God says, exactly the point. Exactly the point. That is wisdom. In my sight. All the nations will see, all the people around you will see and say, what? They're giving their lives themselves, all the precious possessions that they have, they're selling it for their brothers? Whom they didn't even know? This is wisdom. This is wisdom. You know something? I shared this in the Bible study. You know what? God's word says in Jeremiah chapter 18. He says, I am the potter. You are the clay. And I will mold you. You know something? We forget that when he is actually molding, he is molding our mind. Not our circumstances. He is actually taking the circumstances to mold our mind in tune with his word. So that we will conform to the image of Christ. Think about it. Did you see recently, did you know that God, did, did, did God speak to you and said, there's a need in the church and you just shut your eyes. I don't know you want to hear that. Some people say, I don't even have a job. If you cannot give little things now, when God asks you a lot, you will not be able to give. Thank God you didn't have money. 5,000 rupees, 500 rupees type will look very small. What about 50,000? 5,000, okay, still small. 100,000? 10,000 I should give? What? 10,000? Are you sure? Wisdom. Let's move on. Today I just want us to... Am I okay on time? You know something? God's word says where your treasure is, there's your heart. Remember, the first time the ark had to be built. Remember. Remember? Remember? He says, God says he saw the wickedness in man and he said, every thought of this man is evil continually. And he said, he saw one man, Noah, and his children and his wife who were perfect in their generations. Okay, and Noah was walking with God. He was a righteous man. That's what scripture says. So God comes to Noah and he says, build an ark. Okay, God, fantastic. You signed me up for your job. But who's going to pay for the ark? You? Me? Are you sure? Me, God? I need to buy wood with my money? With my money, I saved all my life. You want me to put it in an ark? My money gone? Yeah, absolutely. I thought you'll provide. I gave you the money to build an ark. See that? Whose money? See, the whole thing is totally inverted now. Absolutely inverted. The way God looks at wisdom and we look at wisdom. It's absolutely inverted. 
You are going to pay. Lord, I never even saw rain in my life. I've just obey you at your word and say some rain is going to come. And you're asking me to pour out 120 years of my life to build an ark and give all my money to it? Wisdom. Ultimately, the whole world is on one side and mocking Noah and saying, You fool! But on the day of judgment, who was a fool? Think about it. Just think about it. On the day of judgment, when the water came and God shut the ark, Noah would have said, Thank God, my money went into the ark. Who's a fool? Man, this is a tough word, no? It's tough for me. Tough for me. I'm sure I'm telling you honestly. It's impossible for me to even preach this without God helping me. Because I have to live this. And God says, you know what this is? This guy comes online, he just zaps me. I remember one day I was preaching from this pulpit. He said, you know what? At the end of the month I need a paycheck. Remember? That was actually me. And this eight-year-old guy comes online and he says, work hard for the kingdom and not for your world. Your paycheck comes from God. Fine, so far. Okay, paycheck comes from God. Not from IIIT. What? No, it doesn't come from triple ID. It comes from God. No, no, no. Please don't say that. You know what? He says, JP, I know you in the spirit. Oh my God, he knows me in the spirit. Guard your heart, JP. You know, that's the call for each one of us in the last days. Guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The greatest stewardship is not your family, is not your job, is not your possessions. It is your relationship with your maker. It is your relationship with your maker. You know, I discovered this, I was taught this, this during the last one week. The manual to run the church, if you look at the example that we have, is Acts, the book of Acts. Right? That is the manual everybody has. So it, as it was there in the book of Acts, it has to be in the last church, last day church also. You know what? How many times in the book of Acts the word love was mentioned? Any guesses? Yes, it's binary. Give you the I will give you the clue. It is a binary digit, zero or one. Zero times. What? I thought that this was this God was a God of love. And you know what it is talking about? If you look at the book of Acts, every time when the preacher is coming and challenging the people, it's it's calling them for an accountability with a God. And with a man and his creator. No love. There is a day of reckoning. That is ordered for every man. That is set for every man. And when you give this testimony to people, you know what they will call you? They will call you a madman. You are a fool in the sight of the world. Let me not say that. Let the, let the Bible say. Acts chapter 18. No, 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 not Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 26. <clears throat> Acts chapter 26. This is the account Paul is giving to Agrippa and Festus. Verse 19 onwards. This is the, this is Paul's, Paul's telling, okay? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the, unto the heavenly vision. But I shoot first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works for me for repentance. Because there's a day of reckoning. 
and you will be judged according to the works. Next. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me, because they said, you are a fool. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, and that he should be first, he should be the first of that should rise from the dead, and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, the word beside yourself, much learning has made you mad. You are a madman. You are a fool. What are you talking about? You are beside yourself. Oh, this is what people will say. Look at verse twenty-six. Uh, okay, sorry, so uh, just look. Let's go, go. Let's go on. Much. Okay. And ask, then what? But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak for the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth all these things before whom also I should speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King of Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost you are asking me to get into the ark. You are a madman. You're a fool. Who was a fool? Just think about it. You're a madman. Paul, you're beside yourself. You are going to all these theological seminars, you're going to base tabernacle and your mind is messed up. You're going to a cult. Much learning and teaching of the word of God has made you mad. You're beside yourself. That's, that is going to be the cry of every guy who is in the world. Your lifestyle will challenge him. And they will say, you are mad. You, you can't do this. It's impossible, of course. Who said it? Anybody can. <sighs> fool in the sight of God. A fool in the sight of the world. Romans chapter 1, verse 22 onwards. Sorry, uh, let me tell you the verse. Verse 20 onwards. For the invisible things of Him from the, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. This is what it is. A day of accountability... You will stand before your Creator and you will give an account. That is the gospel. No love, God's all out of the world, everything fine, everything okay. But one day, you will stand before your Creator and you will give an account. This is exactly what he's talking about. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and whose heart, their foolish heart, was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know what? There's this guy um, who's an evolutionist. Okay, he subscribes to the evolution theology. It's a theology, by the way. It's not science. It's just a philosophy which is baloney. And you know what he calls himself? He actually started, a, started his my, magazine. His name is Michael Shermer. I'm not ashamed to call his name. His name is Michael Shermer, who calls himself the bright. The brights. Why? Oh, all the creationists are fools. They can't prove it. But we are the brights. Professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools. Let's move on. 
and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies within themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know what? Through the western world, you will see one thing. They have actually taken off God from their society. At least India has gods. We have not taken God off our society. But the western world has taken God out of their society. And because they have taken God out of their society, the judgment follows. For this cause, God gave them up to wild afflictions. Homosexuality, sexual perverseness, Sodomy is not an effect of denying God. It is God's judgment on a people who have denied God, who have denied their Creator. It's judgment of God over their lives. You know what it says in Genesis chapter 6, if you turn with me. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 3. What's this? And the Lord said, My spirit shall not contend with man forever. For there also flesh. Next, verse 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wicked of wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know what is there's going to be a day. When there's not going to be any more sanity in our society anymore. Just think about it. What was considered to be a taboo a 20 years or 30 years back? You'll see two, two people coming on the, in Hindi movies, they'll come too close together to kiss and they'll turn, out, turn off like that. They'll come like this and turn. And when they hug, they'll hug like this. You know what I'm talking about? 20 years back. It's like, example, God, Pastor James gave, I remember very, very well. A frog, if you put a frog into a pool of hot water, it'll jump immediately. But I put a frog in cold water, put it on a, on a stove, and keep on increasing the heat, heat gradually. It'll stay there, stay there, stay there, and one day die. That's exactly what has happened to our society. You wouldn't believe it. YouTube, you thought, would not screen R-rated movies, right? I'm telling you, people who have young children, don't watch YouTube. Even what you thought was... What do you what that was? Okay, you a server administrator, what do you call that? A guy who administrates, who... Administrator, but then what he does? Huh? He... Moderator. Yes, that's the word. You thought YouTube was moderated, right? You know, you think that there are people sitting in the server rooms who see every file that is coming into YouTube and they will scan it to see if there is garbage. YouTube initially was anti-pornography, anti-R-rated, five years back. But today, R-rated movies absolutely shown and thrown at you from YouTube. Think about it. Just think about it. That's a trap. Man, we are in the last days for sure. And Brother Joe was giving this incredible example on, on during, uh, during uh, Youth Saturday. He said, everybody is trying to get your attention of your eyes, even if it's for a moment. So you go to the elevator and you're waiting for, the, for your lift to come and you'll see a screen showing a woman clad in semi-nude clothes and dancing to, for a tune, Bollywood tune. For a minute. And you're just waiting for a lift. 
Think about it. Everybody, you go on the, on the, on the roads and you stop at Ravindra Bharati's cross section, hoardings, garbage. Everybody asking for the attention of your eyes, thoughts, evil continually. That is incredible. And you come, you, you come to the big institutions which you think, oh, they are the pride of the nation, triple IIT, IIT. And you see the clothing of the women getting shorter and shorter and shorter even as every new batch comes in. I know what I'm talking about. Five years back I saw the batch which passed out of triple IIT. And now the batch which came. A new generation altogether. Think about it. Where are we? I just can go on like this. I mean, I don't know where to stop. I don't have a conclusion for this message. Chapter 9 of Proverbs. Stop. Chapter 1, sorry, not chapter 1, not chapter 9, it's chapter 1 of Proverbs. Verse 20. The difference between a wise man and a foolish man, it's actually found in chapter 1 verse 1. I'm just going to read this, okay? You'll see the way Holy Spirit records the list of things. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. It's very, very ironic that Solomon had to write things about wisdom and end up in hell. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And the first time a wise man is mentioned, a wise man will hear. <laughs> Look at that. Whenever he has to first mention a wise man, a wise man will hear. James chapter 1. Sorry. James chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Swift to hear and slow to speak. And the first time a wise man is mentioned in the book of Proverbs, it says, a wise man will hear. Wow. That's exactly the reason why we badger you with a word two and a half hours every Sunday so that you will practice to hear. Here. That's the only place I believe, I guess, in a church where there's only one monologue. Pastor is speaking, 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 and everybody's listening or hearing. At least they're acting as if they're hearing. <laughs> Verse 20 of Proverbs chapter 1. Wisdom, that is Jesus, cries without. She is a he. He utters his voice in the streets. He cries to the chief place of the concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, he utters his words, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. 
I will pour out my spirit upon you. Can you believe it? This is new covenant. I will pour out my spirit upon you. That is Jesus saying. I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. And when your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then they will call upon me. But I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they will not find me. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of the fools will destroy them. You are prosperous and you are a fool in God's sight. Man, that prosperity is God's judgment over our lives. God's judgment over our lives. Let's turn back to Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 4. Whoso is simple... Let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she said to him, that is Jesus, come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Wow. How many of you love rebuke? I don't love. But if you are a wise man, you will love rebuke. That is the wisdom of God. That is what Jesus said. Don't work for bread that perishes. I am the bread. Let's go to John chapter 6. And we'll end here. And pastor will come into the communion. John chapter 6. Verse 53 onwards. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat of my flesh, of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Verse 66. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. The call to the communion table today. You understand the perspective. Wise up and live. Wise up and live. His life, his life is meat indeed. When he's talking about blood, you know what? To a Jewish mind, this is basically sacrilege. Because God himself said in the scriptures, don't drink blood. Because that is the life. But when Jesus was actually coming and telling them, it says, unless my blood flows through you, unless you're born of me, and my blood, my DNA flows through you, unless you're born again of the Spirit and of the Word of God, unless my life flows through you, you can never enter into the kingdom of God. 
the whole perspective changes sense. Let's ask, our, ask ourselves today, are we fools in God's sight? If not, if yes, let's wise up and live. Let's bow our hearts. Thank you, Father, for this word. Pray, Lord, Father, that you should impress this word upon our hearts and teach us daily, O oh Lord, to walk in your ways. Praise you, Lord, we worship you. In Jesus' name.